Uh, thanks everyone for, for sticking around to the end. And we've heard a few talks uh, over the course of the last couple of days about the potential effects of warming and acidification on reef organisms. And what I'd like to do now is you know, start to address the question of whether they can cope, whether they can adapt uh, to these uh, environmental changes over the sort of time scales that they're occurring. Uh, I'd like to recognise um, the postdocs and the students in particular that have been uh, really doing the work. Um, these are the, the people that have been out there uh, either conducting the experiments, collecting the data, and it's mostly their work that um, I'm going to be presenting today. So just recognising those people. And I'll, I'll certainly mention them as I go along. Okay, so uh, we were releasing around about 35 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere every year. A, a truly astonishing amount of carbon dioxide that uh, humans are putting out. And the rate is increasing. Uh, there was a small blip uh, for the uh, uh, global financial crisis when we managed to slow down a little bit. Uh, but then, of course, there was lots of uh, economic stimulus and uh, we progressed as normal after that. So uh, it's continuing to increase the uh, the actual amount of CO2 we're putting into the atmosphere. Around about 40% of the CO2 we emit stays in the atmosphere, 45%. 25% is taken up by land sinks and around about 30% is taken up by the ocean. And as a result of the CO2 that remains in the atmosphere and that that gets taken up by the ocean, we have these two uh, problems, global warming, and ocean acidification. And we've heard quite a bit about the potential effects of those on reef organisms. What we really want to know is you know, what sort of changes are going to occur and can they uh, adapt through time? And there's a number of approaches we can take to look at those things. Uh, first of all, we can use observations and we can see that, for example, things like the abundance, the distribution and phenology, the timing of life history events uh, are already changing for marine organisms. So we can already document that there are changes in distributions, numbers and uh, life history events for a whole range of marine organisms. There are experiments being done where we place organisms in sort of future conditions, warmer or more acidic conditions, and we look at their responses and we can see that often they're negative. And then we would want to project out to what might happen in the future, and often we'll be using these experimental results to project into the future how things might go. And we might be uh, looking at some sort of timeline into the future uh, where we have some uh, impacts that are occurring and when we get to some sort of environmental threshold then we start to see lots of negative impacts. But of course we won't really know what the uh, effects will be and what the long-term prognosis is uh, unless we're including the potential for acclimation and adaptation over the same time scale that these environmental changes are occurring. So this is a really important issue to address. You know, is there potential or not? Um, so what we really want to talk about is acclimation and adaptation. Now, genetic adaptation is phenotypic change driven by genetic selection, and it's inherited from one generation to the next. And acclimation is a physiological, behavioural or morphological adjustment, but it occurs without genetic selection. So we're talking about plasticity here. But both of these things, we would, both of these processes, we would be looking for a similar sort of response where uh, in the future we might see populations that have adjusted, if I can get the mouse to work, that have adjusted uh, to a new, in this case, warmer environment and their optimal performance uh, is now at a warmer uh, condition. And acclimation, really, in terms of climate change responses, is potentially a really important thing because we know that uh, the rate of change of environmental drivers is uh, unprecedented in geological terms. It's happening relatively fast. Uh, and plasticity has the potential to really keep, keep up. So we can get rapid phenotypic responses to environmental change. So it could be a particularly powerful way that animals adjust and it allows um, them to maintain performance in a new environment. 
And the way they may be able to do that is through something like phenotypic buffering. So what we might be looking for is in terms of the phenotype, we might be hoping to see no particular change. Let's say this is growth rate or survival with increasing CO2 in this case, that we would hope that through acclimation we would see no change. But underneath that, there would be some plasticity in the actual, for example, the physiological or the genetic responses uh, underneath that uh, might be related to energy um, use or calcification or something like that. So there are underlying uh, physiological processes that will be changing that would be allowing the whole organism to maintain performance in the new environment. And the additional benefit of this is that it could give time for adaptation, genetic adaptation, to catch up in the long run. There are three uh, sort of broad types of acclimation that we could think about and that people talk about. Uh, the first one is reversible acclimation. This occurs uh, in adult life phases. It's short-term acclimation adjustments. There can be developmental acclimation. This occurs in juveniles when they're exposed to an environmental condition uh, early in life and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. And transgenerational acclimation that crosses generations. And this is a, a more recent observation that this is actually potentially quite a powerful form of plasticity. So reversible acclimation, uh, we're all probably familiar with this. It's short-term regulated responses to environmental variation, such as daily or seasonal variation. It's very well developed in species or populations from variable environments. The sort of thing we think about are uh, no tide pools or temperate waters that see large seasonal fluctuations in temperature. And we can see um, that animals actually adjust their responses seasonally. And here's a, just a, a good example uh, from this um, uh, very attractive looking a lugworm and what we can, oops, and we can see that the metabolic rate of the worm in relation to temperature is different in winter, spring and summer. So it acclimates its physiological responses uh, on a seasonal basis and that's quite common for uh, temperate water animals. Developmental acclimation is a little bit different. It's usually irreversible and it's a response to environmental conditions that are experienced during early ontogeny and it can allow the the animal to actually have improved performance in those conditions later in life if it's experienced during a critical window during early life. And just a really good example of this was some work that was uh, done recently with uh, zebrafish where they found that just exposing zebrafish to uh, increased temperatures, a couple of degrees extra temperature during a few days during embryonic development meant that they uh, had much better swimming performance at those temperatures later in life. So there can be critical windows that if they uh, experience those environmental conditions early in life, then they do better uh, later in life, and that's developmental acclimation. The one I really want to talk about today is transgenerational acclimation, and this is where the environment experienced by the parents, or even earlier generations, influences the offspring's environment to the conditions that it experiences. And this is also known as transgenerational plasticity. And a really good example of this was some work uh, that was done uh, quite a long time ago uh, on Daphnia. And Daphnia uh, can produce these two different morphs. Uh, one has a the pointy helmet and one has a round helmet at top. And the pointy helmet uh, appears to uh, help them resist predators. And what uh, was found was that if you exposed the parents when they were pregnant, if you expose the, the mothers to uh, the chemical cues of a predator, then she would produce more of these helmeted, pointy helmeted uh, offspring. And it wasn't just the, her offspring, it was her grand offspring as well. So this would go through several generations and uh, they would actually be more of these uh, helmeted types if the parents were exposed to particular conditions. And there are a number of ways that the parents can influence the, uh, the quality of their offspring. They can do it through, for example, nutrients, uh, things like uh, yolk sacs if, uh, for fish, uh, milk in uh, cows and, and, uh, and other mammals, uh, somatic factors, for example, uh, hormones. It can be in the gametes, uh, in placenta or glandular secretions, protein. So there's a whole lot of somatic factors that can be in, uh, transmitted between parents and their offspring. And one of the really interesting things and that Sylvain was talking about earlier was epigenetic state and, for example, uh, DNA methylation and chromatin structure. I'm just going to mention a little bit more about uh, these because uh, we think this is uh, probably something that's uh, quite important in some of the, the studies and the results that we've got. Uh, 
DNA methylation is critical for gene expression. Uh, it modifies the activation of genes. And importantly, it can be influenced by the environment and it can be transmitted across generations. So we can get trans generational transfer of epigenetic marks. And so here is a mechanism of sort of heritable change in gene expression. Doesn't involve changes in the gene code, but it can be influenced by the environment. And so this is a potentially really powerful way uh, that you can get the influence of the environment in one generation that influences the uh, of, uh, subsequent offspring or even uh, subsequent generations. So we've been looking at uh, transgenerational acclimation in reef fish and one of the first studies we did uh, was uh, done by Jenny Donaldson who's now a postdoc and uh, she looked at the effects of rising water temperature on this fish here, the spinal damsel fish, and this is uh, sort of our lab rat. Uh, it does really well in captivity and we can do all sorts of wonderful experiments with it. And we've been studying it for a long time. And we know from the, all the previous work that this fish has really limited capacity for reversible acclimation. It doesn't matter how long we hold it as an adult uh, in higher temperatures, it doesn't seem to improve its ability to cope with higher temperatures. And temperatures of just about one and a half to three degrees higher than the average summer temperatures affect its growth, reproduction and aerobic performance. Uh, it really doesn't like those uh, warmer temperatures. So we've been rearing these fish over multiple generations and looking for developmental and transgenerational acclimation. So what to do that, uh, we keep the, uh, bring the breeding pairs in from the wild, we keep them at current day temperatures to adjust them to the, habituate them to the lab conditions. Then in the F1 generation, we rear them up under either control conditions or plus one more plus five, uh, plus three degrees. Then in the F2s, we do the same thing, but in the current day, we also rear them under the higher temperatures. And then we test them, we test their uh, response at the control temperatures and either the 1.5 or the three degrees higher. And this is a really powerful design because it allows us to tease out acute effects of elevated temperature, developmental acclimation, and transgenerational effects. Uh, are there any of these? And so I'll walk you through this graph. This is uh, stuff that was published a few years ago. And this, uh, we were looking at the effects of increased temperature on aerobic scope. And uh, Morgan presented some uh, aerobic scope data last night. Uh, you don't need to know too much about it other than it is thought to be a reasonably good proxy for the performance of something like a fish. So the whole animal performance. This is the uh, aerobic scope of controls. And as you see, uh, at high temperatures, if they've had no acclimation to warmer temperatures, that actually at higher temperatures when they're exposed to it, that we get a decline in aerobic scope. Uh, if they've been reared up since hatching under the higher temperatures, so they've had the potential for developmental acclimation, we see not very much improvement other than there's a slight improvement in the uh, warmest group. So there's a little bit of developmental acclimation here, but they don't get anywhere near back to control levels. So still, their performance is still quite a lot lower than the controls. But what's really amazing is if the parents have been under the higher temperatures, then we see complete um, adjust, um, uh, acclimation of aerobic scope uh, and maybe even a slight overshooting. They perform even a little bit better. But the main point here is that having the parents under those conditions makes all the difference to how you interpret the effects of warmer water on these fish and that they are completely able to compensate their aerobic scope uh, across uh, two generations. And we more recently started to look at the mechanism of this. I mean, how does this happen? And what we're really interested in are the genes and cellular processes that are involved. And the way we're doing this is through a whole transcriptome analysis. So we're looking at the, all the gene expression that's uh, happening in these fish in these different treatments, and then we're correlating the levels of gene expression with the phenotypic responses that we've seen and trying to tease out which genetic pathways, which cellular pathways uh, are involved. And I'm not going to go into great detail on this because we're uh, currently working this up for publication. We haven't quite got to the stage where we've got everything together, but it's looking like uh, very much that there are some important metabolic pathways that are involved in actually fueling this ability to improve their, um, their aerobic scope. Uh, things like uh, lipid to lipid pathways, and they look like they're going to be very, very important. 
We've also been looking at transgenerational acclimation in relation to ocean acidification, and this has been uh, work that we're focusing on more recently. Uh, Gabby Miller's been doing a lot of this work, and she's been looking at the effects of having the parents exposed to higher CO2 levels on how the offspring perform. So she's conducted very similar experiment to that that uh, Jenny did, uh, just slightly different, brought in the parents, uh, breeding pairs, and held them under the control conditions or higher CO2 levels for about nine months. And then the offspring were reared up in the same conditions as the parents, except that the controls were either reared up under control conditions or under high CO2. And she also cross-factored this with uh, temperature, had three temperatures. And we reared the juveniles up for a month and then looked at a range of life history traits. And using this design, what we can look, look at are the sort of acute effects of high CO2. So this is what most people are doing in ocean acidification experiments at the moment, uh, plonking animals into a high CO2 environment and seeing uh, what it does to them. And looking at this, we can look at if there are some transgenerational effects that might help moderate those responses. And indeed, that's exactly what we saw. So here we've got standard length and survival of the juveniles in the three temperature treatments. Uh, these are the control fish. So these came from control parents. They were reared up under control conditions. This is the length of the fish. This is what you get if you rear them from control parents, but uh, they were reared up under high CO2. Uh, this is the uh, length of the fish. This is survival. You can see it's significantly reduced they're smaller and they have reduced survival. But if their parents had been under high CO2, uh, there was complete compensation, completely back to the control levels. So this clearly shows that the parental conditions are really important and that they can actually compensate across generations. There's an interaction with temperature, but the main story of this is that um, the parental environment ameliorates the impact of high CO2 on this particular fish. Now, those of you that might have been following some of the work we've uh, done over the last few years will know that one of the, the really interesting things, and, and uh, was a discovery we were not really expecting at all, was that we found that high CO2 levels affect the behaviour of fish in really quite dramatic ways. And the first work that we did, uh, we found that there was an impaired ability of juvenile fish to discriminate between chemical cues critical chemical cues if they've been exposed to high CO2. So if they're reared up under a high CO2 environment, they couldn't distinguish between the odours of different settlement habitats, between kin and non-kin, between predators and non-predators. And these are things that we know that these little baby fish can normally do really well, uh, and they're critical to their survival. But in a high CO2 environment, they're unable to do that. And some work that uh, Danny Dixon did uh, when she was uh, doing a postdoc, uh, sorry, doing a PhD with me, she showed that uh, they were even became attracted to the odour of predators. So not only didn't they respond, uh, in this case it was even worse, they became attracted to, to the smell of their predators. And uh, now that's unlikely to be very good for your fitness. We've uh, subsequently found that it affects a whole range of behaviours in including just basic activity levels. And it seems that the fish are generally more active and that they exhibit riskier behaviour. Now, for example, moving further away from shelter. And all of these things are likely to increase the uh, risk of mortality uh, from predation. So knowing that, uh, the question is, now, do the sorts of uh, transgenerational acclimation that we've seen in these other traits, for example, with the physiology of the fish in their growth rates uh, and things like aerobic scope, the transgenerational acclimation, do we see the same things for behaviour? If we expose the uh, uh, fish for longer or the adults to uh, these conditions, will we get improvements in their behaviour? So the first way to, to have a look at this was we wanted to um, see if the fish had been exposed their entire life to high CO2, not just a short period of time in an experiment in the lab, but the whole life would we still see these same changes in behaviour? Is this just due to you know, having a short-term shock of high CO2? Or if you reared up your whole life under high CO2, so you had the opportunity for developmental acclimation, would you still be affected? So one of the first ways uh, we went about that was we've used these natural CO2 seeps that occur in Papua New Guinea, where there's uh, CO2 bubbling up through the reef uh, from a re result of um, uh, the magma close to the surface of the earth there, uh, heating old coral reef, and we get uh, natural CO2 areas that have conditions that are reasonably similar to what we might predict for the future under 
in a high CO2 world. They're relatively small, but they're naturally acidified, and the fish there are permanently exposed to high CO2 from the time they settle down onto the reef. And so we could look at their behaviour of fish in those seeps to see whether um, permanent exposure had adjusted their behaviour. And in fact, it hadn't. We saw almost identical behavioural problems in the fish at these little CO2 seeps as we did in our experiments. They were attracted to the smell of predators rather than being repelled from them. They were more active and they uh, ventured further from shelter. So in all of these things, it's pretty much exactly the same as we've seen in the experiments. Um, they uh, have riskier behaviour and that they're more prone to predators. So it would seem that there's no potential for within generational acclimation uh, of these sort of behavioural problems. And the seeps are really quite good at getting that and we've just uh, published a paper on that. So then we had to ask the question, well, is there any opportunity for transgenerational acclimation? If the parents had been exposed to high CO2, the one thing the seeps are not good at is doing this transgenerational work because they're quite small and the parents of these fish that are recruiting into the seeps almost certainly living outside of the seeps. So uh, Meg Welsh has been doing um, some fantastic work on this, doing transgenerational work, looking at the effects of uh, having parents exposed high CO2 on the behaviour of the fish. And what was shown here is the uh, time spent in an alarm queue. You can think of this as much the same as the time spent in a predator odour. Uh, for fish that had control parents, mid CO2 or high CO2 parents. And what you can see is for the controls that if they are exposed to high CO2, if they're reared up under high CO2, uh, normally the control fish, uh, if they're reared up under control conditions, avoid the queue, but if they are uh, reared up under high CO2, they become highly attracted to this alarm queue. Uh, and that's really a maladaptive strategy. And in fact, we find for behaviour that we see exactly the same thing. It doesn't matter if the parents have been reared up under, have been exposed to high CO2 or not, we see exactly the same behavioural problems. So while we see very strong effects of transgenerational acclimation on physiological responses, on life history traits, we don't in behaviour. So uh, there's no, no acclimation of impaired olfactory responses and I think that's uh, very important and it tells us that in this case uh, we're not going to see uh, rapid plastic responses and we'd have to start to look at the potential for genetic adaptation, selection and adaptation over the time frame that these problems are going to be occurring. So just uh, by way of wrapping this up, um, I think transgenerational acclimation is potentially a really powerful mechanism by which populations can adjust to uh, rapid environmental change. And it's something we have to factor in to our projections when we start to talk about what might be going to happen you know, 20, 50, 100 years out, given that that's well within several generations of most marine organisms. Um, it may take several generations for full acclimation, for the full acclimation potential uh, to be expressed, but no, potentially that time's there. Um, it does mean that many short-term experiments may be inadequate for predicting long-term consequences, and we just have to uh, accept that, I think. But, of course, not all traits are going to acclimate across uh, generations. We've seen no complete acclimation of physiological performance, but not behaviour. Uh, and that's going to be very interesting to work out why on earth that might be the case. There's a whole bunch of really interesting unanswered questions in this field. Um, now, will this acclimation that we've seen across generations, is it going to persist for the long term? We don't know. Um, I think one of the most interesting things is going to be, will it affect the rate of genetic adaptation? Now, will, actually, will phenotypic plasticity actually potentially retard um, adaptation by shifting the phenotype without selection? Or could it accelerate genetic adaptation by things like genetic assimilation? These are things we just we don't know. Uh, it's just way too early on. And we certainly don't know how widespread this is among marine taxa uh, and which species uh, can benefit. And it's something that we need to work on, you know, working at how to predict uh, which species will be able to uh, express transgenerational acclimation and which won't. And uh, I think I'll leave it there. Thanks. <laughs>